Good morning. Welcome to this symposium focused on uh, optimizing your clinical practice with OCT and uh, OCT angiography. I am Vincent uh, Bordery, and uh, not Bordery, as it's written, from Paris, uh, France, and I'm pleased to moderate this symposium. We have a panel of experts who will address some main issues of OCT and OCT angiography. Uh, since OCT was first introduced in ophthalmology, our routine clinical practice has been dramatically modified. Before OCT implementation, most of the information relevant for clinical practice was obtained at sleep lamp examination. Currently, we routinely first look at OCT images and then go to the sleep lamp. It makes sense when we consider that the most relevant information is provided by OCT images. This is a real revolution in ophthalmology practice. I would like to thank Optoview for organizing this symposium and for developing high-definition OCT technology we find so useful for our patients. So we will have four talks and then after time for discussion and for questions. Our, our first speaker will be Dr. Frank Goez, uh, Dr. Goez is the medical director of the Goez High Center located in Antwerp, Belgium, and is also president of the Belgian High Laser Society. He has a vast experience in cataract and laser surgery and a special interest in cataract surgery with multifocal implants and IOL calculations after previous refractive surgery. So please, Dr. Goy, give your talk. So thank you, Professor Brodery, uh, for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity for having me. Um, the talk of my, of this, the first talk of this session will be uh, the use of TCP in my clinical practice. It's a full room, and I hope that you, all of you didn't come only for the sandwiches, and I hope at the end that you will uh, have learned something. As we all know, a lot of refractive surgery has been done over the last few years. Here you can see the graph that, uh, that gives you an idea about the amount of laser surgery that was done over the last 20 or 25 years. And as we all know, these patients will age, they will get older, they will develop cataract, and they will need cataract surgery. And cataract surgery after refractive surgery is uh, not the same as in a routine uh, patient that didn't undergo refractive surgery, since the relation between the, front, between the front side and the back side of the cornea changes. A normal relation uh, has a correlation of 82% if you compare front and back side of the cornea, and after refractive surgery it changes, so you need a different way of calculation. Um, you can do it in uh, different ways. You can do the calculation like we all did the last 10 years, um, doing a topography and use these measurements and adapt your formulas. Or you can just measure the cornea, the front and the back side of the cornea, which you can do um, with the recent advancements like the OCT. And the Optoview uh, uh, Avanti OCT has a cornea module with a TCP, with a total corneal power um, possibility that you can just measure the front and the back side of the cornea and use this data to do the calculation of the lens. So this gives you an example of the information that is given to you by the OCT. It gives you it gives you an idea of the, the power of the cornea, the anterior power of the cornea, the posterior power of the cornea, and this is the total corneal power. It gives you an idea about the pachymetry of the cornea, and you can enter these data in, um, in a spreadsheet that is given to you by Optoview, or use the data like we will do in the future online on the website of the ACRS. So this is the spreadsheet that was used until now, and if you enter all the data of the Optoview um, uh, machine, then it will give you an idea about the power of the lens that you have to implant. Otherwise, if you use a certain power, uh, if it's 17.2, and if you use a, an IOL of 18, then it will give you an idea about the predicted 
residual error that you will have after the surgery. You can enter these data not only in the Excel sheet, but also on the ASRS website. Um, that will give you an idea about the OCT method, but also about other methods to do the calculation. Um, we use the Hirschstrahl lens star um, to do the to do the, the the other methods of calculation, and um, if you use the the, the the lens star, you can also use the pre and the post op data to use the clinical history methods as well as the non clinical history methods. And doing this, you can co compare the OCT method with, for for instance, the Barrett True K method, the Masket method, the modified Masket method, and the Shamas No History method. So we did this for a group of patients and we compared the different formulas. And we were anxious to see whether the TCP method was better, yes or no. And um, um, first of all, you have to know that the, the, the methods that, that don't use a clinical history, it's much easier for, for the surgeon. You can have time off in the weekend. We don't want to spend all the weekend in front of the computer or calling colleagues to have uh, access to preoperative data that sometimes you will find, but sometimes you will not find. If you can just measure without clinical data, it's much easier. So we, did, we had a group of 15 patients that had a previous myopic uh, LASIK or PRK that underwent cataract surgery afterwards. We had a group of eight patients that underwent post um, hyperopic LASIK or PRK and that had an IOL afterwards, and 15 patients had RK with an, with an implant afterwards. So the methods of the study were um, we compared or we calculated the expected post-op refraction um, for the implanted uh, IOL, and we compared the expected post-op refraction for the different groups. The error was the post-op refraction minus the expected refraction according to the different formulas. If it's a positive value, it means that it was a hyperopic error. If it's a negative value, it means that it's a myopic error. So first of all, for the non-history methods, we compare the OCT method with all the different methods. And first of all, with the methods that don't take the history, clinical history into account. And first of all, the myopic LASIK uh, group, the root mean square error gave a slightly myopic uh, error for the OCT method. Um, but for the Barrett true history method, and for the Shamas no history method, the error was, was higher in our small group. I must admit that the group is quite small, so we didn't do any statistics, and in the future we will have bigger groups. But this was um, quite uh, interesting for us that the OCT method in our hands for these patients was better. For the hyperopic group, we've seen completely the same, that the error for the TCP method was smaller than for the better no history method or for the Shamas no history method. The RK group is a little, a little bit more different. Um, the, there, the error was a little bit higher, um, uh, was, was negative for the, the TCP and also positive for the, the Barrett, and we couldn't compare the Shamas no history method in a few patients that we did. So then if you compare the OCT method with uh, other methods that use the refractive history, so the previous slide was method that didn't use the refractive history, maybe you might think that if you use the refractive history, you have more data, so it will be more accurate. So we also had the three groups, the myopic LASIK PRK group, the hyperopic LASIK PRK group, and the RK group. And also here for the myopic PRK or LASIK group, the error of the TCP was um, lower than for the Barrett True K, than for the Masket, and then for the modified Masket. You have to take into account that it's not the mean error, but the root mean square error. So every error, uh, we took the root mean square of it. For the hyperopic group also, the, the, the error of the um, OCT method um, was lower than for the Barrett True K method, for the Masket method, and for the modified Masket method. And for the RK group, in a few patients that we did, our error was a little bit higher with the TCP method, but we had really low standard deviations. So the results were lying closely to each other, and there was no big uh, spread amongst uh, the results. So 
There has been a lot of publications on this topic. Um, the group of uh, Professor Douglas Koch and Li Wang um, uh, published extensively on the subject and they found the same thing. They also found that the OCT method provided smaller variances of the predicted uh, errors than other methods. And, um, and they published it in the article of Ophthal in, in the Journal of Ophthalmology uh, of some years ago, with a lar which is a large peer-reviewed uh, journal, of course. So in conclusion, the, the TCP method that we use uh, using the OCTs has become our preferred eye well calculation method after previous refractive surgery. Maybe you can increase the accuracy a little bit if you do all the, com the, the, all the calculations together and look at all the data, but if you have to choose one method, in my hands it would be the, the, the TCP method with the OCT. It's really easy to, to use. You don't have to call your colleagues. You don't have to go f looking after previous refractive data. And you don't have to take into account the, the refractive difference between pre-op and post-op the laser treatment. It's not always easy if you have a minus 6 that underwent LASIK that became minus, uh, minus 0.5. Um, but because of the cataract surgery, they developed some, some myopia and they, they ended up at minus 2. Um, it's not always easy to know that the refractive effect was minus 5.5 and, and not minus 4. So it's difficult to see when the myopization of the cataract uh, starts and when the stability of the laser treatment uh, ended. And you don't have to take into account these problems if you use a direct um, uh, the direct method that you can use using the TCP with the OCT. Um, in our hands and in this group, we rather had myopic errors than hyperopic errors, uh, which is something that we prefer. If you don't have emetropia, I prefer some, like all of us we do, uh, we prefer some myopia instead of hyperopia. So in conclusion, at this moment, we really uh, think that this method is the preferred method of, uh, for doing IOL calculation after previous refractive surgery. Thank you. And um, I was told that questions would be asked at the end, so maybe if you agree, we will do all the presentations and then questions will be at the end. Is that okay for you? Then it's my honor to introduce to you uh, Professor uh, Broderie. Professor Broderie is the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology and he's a member of the directory board of the Quinze It's which is a hospital in Paris, France. Professor Broderie, uh, Broderie specializes in anterior segment surgery, Cor uh, transplantation, corneal and ocular surface diseases, and ocular um, infectious diseases. He has published numerous peer-reviewed peer paper papers on surgery and imaging of the cornea. Welcome, Professor Broderie. Thank you. So, my topic will be the role of epithelial sickness mapping in management of corneal disorders. Uh, OCT mapping uh, can be useful for uh, many tasks uh, in uh, management of corneal disorders. For instance, screening of patients before refractive surgery, diagnosis and assessment of keratoconus, diagnosis of corneal epithelial dystrophies and degenerations, diagnosis of dry eye, diagnosis and assessment of limbal deficiency, and also follow-up of patients after refractive surgery. When we look at the epithelial map, we have to keep in mind a key feature of the corneal epithelial physiology. That is, the corneal epithelium will get thicker in case of local stromal thinning and thinner in case of local stromal thickening. And that's why we may have regression of refractive correction after myopic corneal photoablation. Uh, Currently, assessment of patients before refractive surgery cannot be done only based on corneal topography. Structural assessment of cornea is mandatory, and for uh, that task, uh, spectral domain OCT is probably uh, the best method. Uh, mapping is really useful for early diagnosis of keratoconus, uh, diagnosis of basement membrane dystrophy, and diagnosis of dry eye. And I will show you some examples. To start, let's have a look to the, these four corneas. One is a normal cornea, one is co a sick cornea, a thin cornea, and a cornea with early 
keratoconus. If you look at the corneal thickness maps, you clearly see uh, <laughs> corneal thinning in case of early keratoconus, what you don't have in uh, the other three corneas, and is of course a localized thinning of cornea. But if you look at the epithelium uh, maps, then differences are more evident. And clearly here you see localized epithelial thinning in case of early keratoconus. You don't have in case of thin normal or thick cornea. If you look at the stromal map, also you will see localized uh, stromal thinning in case of keratoconus you don't have in uh, the other three corneas. Not only spectral domain OCT is useful for uh, early diagnosis of keratoconus, but also for very early diagnosis of keratoconus. I mean, di diagnosis of keratoconus first, uh, that is keratoconus with normal topography. In fact, if you look at the sinus corneal zone and you measure the epithelial thickness in this zone, you can clearly differentiate normal corneas from from first keratoconus, early keratoconus, and advanced keratoconus. And if the epithelial thickness is below 52 micron in this zone, then you have a high chance of having keratoconus. We now have several indicators of keratoconus on the spectral domain OCT uh, data, and two of them permit early diagnosis of the disease. Uh, which are the minimal corneal thickness and the epithelial thickness in the sinus corneal zone. One more example of keratoconus. Here you clearly see the localized epithelial thinning on the epithelial map. And if you use the recent uh, normalized display of uh, epithelial mapping, you will see more evidently uh, epithelial thinning in the inferior zone of cornea. I, one more time, on the stromal map, you will also see st localized stromal thinning. A few years ago, we have proposed a new classification of keratoconus based on OCT scan. In this classification, stage one corresponds to early disease with localized epithelial thinning, as we saw. Stage two corresponds to stromal thinning with epithelial thickening at the level of conus. Stage 3 corresponds to major stromal thinning and major epithelial thickening with a bow tie pattern. And stage 4 corresponds to uh, pound stromal scarring. Uh, we've classified corneas with high drops as stage 4, stage 5, either acute or chronic uh, high drops after healing of Desmet's membrane. Uh, spectral domain OCT is useful for uh, the diagnosis, but also for treatment. As you know, the main uh, treatment is cross-linking, and for cross-linking, we need a minimal stromal thickness of 400 micron. And if, if you keep in mind the, the map, the, the scans of a stage 3 keratoconus, you can see that Despite an apparently normal or subnormal uh, corneal thickness, you can have very thin stroma at the level of the conus. So, stromal maps are very useful to uh, diagnose these patients that should not be treated with conventional cross linking. Uh, for uh, corneal epithelial basement membrane dystrophy diagnosis, you all know uh, these typical uh, slit lamp images, but sometimes it's, it's not very uh, easy to make the diagnosis at slit lamp. And in these cases, the epithelial maps are very useful, showing localized epithelial thickening. And then if you take scans at the level of uh, this abnormal zone, you will see the abnormal basement membrane forming C's duplication and so on. One more case of a patient with uh, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. You can see on the epithelial map localized uh, epithelial thickening in the upper part of uh, corneas, and it's more evident with uh, the new um, normalized uh, display mode. And if you 
after all that time, take scans at the level of the abnormal zones, you will see the abnormal uh, basement membrane insinuating within the corneal epithelium. For the right eye, we clearly see epithelial sinning uh, in uh, patients with severe dry eye and sometimes also uh, corneal sinning. Uh, <laughs> For patients with refractive surgery, it's quite useful to follow the, them with uh, OCT to monitor the epithelial and stromal sickness and also to uh, early diagnose complication of refractive surgery. For instance, uh, epithelial ingrowth. If you look at the epithelial map, you see that it's clearly abnormal and you will take scans or on fast imaging that will show you uh, the epithelial ingrowth. Uh, we were interested in uh, the diagnosis of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency with OCT. Uh, here you have three different cornea. One is a normal one, a moderately affected cornea with extended contact lens wear and a, a severely affected cornea with uh, limbal stem cell deficiency related to aniridia. Just have a look to the epithelial maps. You have clear differences between the normal uh, cornea and uh, the, the cornea with uh, uh, severe limbal deficiency, which features high variability of corneal epithelial sickness. Then you can go to the limbus and assess the limbal niche with cross sections parallel to the limbus. Here you can clearly see the normal limbal niche in a normal cornea with the palisades of vox on the limbal crypts. And in a patient with a severe limbal deficiency, the limbal niche structures are completely lost. You can assess also the limbus with cross sections perpendicular to the limbus, and you can differentiate a normal cornea from a cornea with severe limbal deficiency. And finally, you will look at on fast section of the limbal region, and you can see clear differences between a normal cornea, where you can clearly see the palisades of vox and the limbal crypt, from a cornea with a severe limbal deficiency, where you, you don't see uh, the limbal niche. Uh, when we compare patients with uh, limbal deficiency and patients with uh, normal corneas, we have clear differences in epithelial sickness for minimal, maximal, minimal, minus, max, and standard deviations. But also, we saw that poor visual acuity was significantly associated with lower minimal corneal epithelial sickness, higher maximal corneal epithelial sickness, higher standard deviation and higher difference between mean and max coronal epithelial sickness. So OCT is really useful for uh, diagnosis, evaluation, and follow-up of many coronal disorders. And I must say that currently we always assess patient, coronal patients with OCT and often we first look at OCT images before we look at the slate lab. Thank you for our for attention. So our next speaker will be Dr. Maria Cristina Savastano. Uh, she is a retina specialist and uh, she is uh, currently practicing at the Centro Italiano Macula Clinic directed by Professor Bruno Lumbroso uh, in Rome. Over the last five years, uh, she has been applying her knowledge in medical retina to the study of clinical applications for OCT angiography, and uh, she has published numerous uh, uh, peer review uh, papers. Thank you. And uh, my talk is about diagnosis and following up on retinal pathologies uh, with angioview of CT angiography. 
And recently, uh, we uh, appreciate the analysis of retinal vascular into the retina without dye injection associated to the analysis of the retinal structure by the use of LCT angiography. Uh, the most uh, important application is uh, in uh, wet IMD. Here we can observe the, an uh, B scan or CT where is observable some dysregulation uh, in uh, above the RPE and fluorescein angiography that shows some anomalies of circulation. By the HCT angiography, it is possible to see exactly the silhouette of neovascularization and follow these uh, anomalies during the um, injection of anti F. It's possible to observe to the uh, CNV below the RPE, like in CNV type 1, that are uh, relative to the other retinal uh, space. In uh, RAP lesion, so uh, when we have the anastomosis uh, between uh, the deep circulation and RPE, like we can observe in this type of signs, that is defined like a case sign, we uh, can see the articulation between uh, an anastomosis in your CT angiography when we make the scan exactly in the, at that, at that level. In myopic patient too, when it is complicated by uh, CMV, we can observe in the correspondence of other retina or uh, in choriocapillaris about the CMV that is well observable over the time. By the use of LCT angiography, it is possible over the time to see, study the evolution of CNV during the anti vujef treatment, like in this case, after a few days, it is possible to observe the reduction of CNV. And this is a practice in a clinical without dye injection. Sometimes it's useful, the OCT angiography, especially in the difficult diagnosis when we don't know exactly uh, where are observed. Like in these cases that uh, can be dubbed uh, if there is a CMV or not. We can perform the OCT angiography in a vascular zone and we cannot observe anything of anomalous in this area. We can perform here the OCT choreocapillary analysis and no alteration can be observed. So, with the clinical application and ophthalmoscopic observation, we can see that this patient has a pseudovitelliform. Dry HMD uh, um, can be very useful to study by LCT angiography. As we observed here, the LCT angiography that is defined in correspondence of choriocapillaries uh, show exactly the um, wind of effect uh, um, due to the absence of RPE, and we can observe the, the choriocapillaries aspect that are well defined in uh, alpha scan to. But uh, why is it so important to study OCT angiography, uh, dry HMD in OCT angiography? Because recently, uh, Rosenfeld and his collaborator described dry, in dry HMD patient a subclinical non exudative new vessels in 21% of cases. In fact, by the means of the OCT angiography, we um, were able to observe this new type, new entity of CNV that are defined as non exudative. If we observe these uh, two scans that are performed uh, in 2015 and 2018, we can see that there is no difference between one each other. If we can see here, we can observe non exudative CNV in the same data. And this is a new entity that was observed only by the means of OCT angiography. What about the diabetic retinopathy? We can see here the fluoration angiography where superficial and deep nectar are overlapped. By the OCT angiography, it is possible to study separately these two uh, networks. 
As we uh, observed here, there is just a little alteration in profile in Yuxtafovel area in this patient with diabetic, early diabetic signs. If we perform the OCT angiography, we can see the ischemia, and so the dropout of capillary that define the early stage of macular ischemia. Like in these cases where the poor vision of patient is observed because by the no flow analysis and the flow density show and severe uh, ischemic in macular region. Like in these cases where we can follow this patient from the healthy form to severe form in superficial nectar and deep nectar with the absence of the vascularization in fovea. The trend analysis of flow density can be observed in patients, like in these cases, with no damage in flow area in diabetic patient in superficial and deep vascularization. In diabetic macular edema, sometimes we uh, observe the mainly congestion in correspondence of deep nectar, like in cases of cystoid edema, where it's possible to distinguish the macular ischemia too. In fact, in the cystoic edema, we can observe the totally black rounded devoid of flow. Uh, in contrast, the ischemia and so capillary non perfusion is a gray with the irregular border. Even in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we can observe the differences because the fluorescein in angiography masked the effect of new vessels, while in OCT angiography, we can define the exactly a precise silhouette of neovascularization. In this auto montage HT C six, we can distinguish the uh, proliferation by the means of the, this rounded yellow, and we can observe near the disc elsewhere and near the ischemic area. Even in BRV hall, we can observe the difference because flow's disc regulation after weight inclusion is well observable and is masked by lecture pooling effect in fluoration in angiography. This is a comparing between healthy and BRV hall, where the capillary dropout is well observable in BRV patient. So we can see ischemia in both superficial and deep. We can see the bead, the fast irregularity, irregular dilatation, and vascular congestion. This is a case in which the branch artery occlusion acute is observable uh, with a sponge edema inside the area of uh, the air occlusion, area of occlusion. And uh, we can see here, especially in the density map, but even in the correspondence of the vascularization analysis, the area of occlusion. After two months, the similar patient had this area of absence of inner nuclear layer, in which uh, there is a in reference map and map inner layer a precise overlapping of area of his chemical. In pachycoroid disorder, like in acute CSC, it's possible to see something of anomalous in other retina. In these cases, it's not observable. But in these cases with chronic CNC, we can see the, in a vascular zone the choroid anomalies because there is a typical CNV. These typical CNV are named bilateral filamentous CNV and can be bilateral like in these cases. This was described primarily by uh, the Professor Lumbroso and was named Filamentous Vascular Network. So, in conclusion, OCT angiography allows vascular analysis in vivo with a non-invasive uh, method, so we don't have no dye, uh, may be repeated frequently with the possible visualization of a of the layers separately that are generally overlapped with by fluorescent angiography or ICG, with new vessel visualization precise the silhouette, with the highlight dropout area ischemia visualization and quantitative vascular analysis. Thank you, and you are all invited in the pro in next uh, Congress, International Congress in Rome, organized by Professor Lombroso, next 14 and 15 of December, where over 200 international speakers will come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savastano.
Thank you. So, after these very nice images of uh, retina, it's uh, always uh, fantastic to see how beautiful they are, uh, we move to the last talk, uh, which will be given by Dr. Luca Di Antonio. Uh, Dr. Di Antonio is a retina consultant at the University uh, D'Annunzio of Chieti Pescara, Italy. Uh, his clinical research interests are focused on retroretinal disease, retinal imaging, and glaucoma. Uh, he's co investigator in several clinical trials and is a member of the Italian uh, Association of Ophthalmology and a co founder of Italian Society of OCT Angiography. So, his talk will focus on OCT Angiography in optic nerve head disorders. me in this meeting and so uh, this is my disclosure and at first uh, in the last 30 years we witnessed to a re-evolution of the optical nerve head imaging from color to nowadays OCT angiography as a previously uh, uh, said by the Dr. Savastano optical current tomography angiography is a new safe and fast dialysis method for studying both retinal and optic nerve circulation, because it gives us both the structural and functional information. But first, we have to take a step back by remembering the optic nerve circulation that can be distinguished in two main plexes, the superficial uh, nourished by RPC or radial capillary peripapillaris, and the, the deep by the choroid. And so RPC can be considered as, uh, as uh, the fourth uh, vascular network in uh, the retina. And uh, this uh, usually nourish the superficial nerve fiber layers surrounding the optic nerve head and play uh, a role in several optic nerve head disorders. So OCT angiography is a, a true angiostratigraphy because it is a deeper result with respect to the standard for us in angiography. And so OCT angiography can be applied uh, in uh, several optic nerve air disorder like glaucoma or uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, hereditary disease and neurodegenerative disease. But uh, how OCTA can be implemented in, uh, in glaucoma? With the angiodisc uh, analysis that uh, recently uh, received uh, FDA clearance. And uh, uh, it is based on the analysis of the, the sector modifi modified by Gary Hitley. And so it's possible to obtain a trend analysis of the, the disc in order to obtain a close follow-up by studying both the RPC vessel density and the R and alpha L thickness. Several studies stated that there was a decreasing of RPC vessel density in patients with primary open open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension compared to the healthy subject. Moreover, the decrease in structural and functional parameters, such as uh, visual defect or RNF thickness, is strongly correlated with the impairment of vessel density of the RPC. And moreover, RPC vessel density is not affected by the flow effect like RNF thickness. And then the choroidal microvasculature dropout was associated with the visual defect. This is uh, an example of the RPC impairment in case of ocular hypertension. Another case of the uh, preperimetric glaucoma, you can see the reduction of the vessel density. And this is the case of the focal defect in the early glaucoma that uh, perfectly correspond to the RNFL defect and visual test defect. So, meanwhile, in, uh, in diffuse glaucoma, we see the diffuse reduction of the RPC vessel density. And so, with OCTA, it's possible to obtain a, a certain glaucoma staging system like visual test. 
And uh, like I said before, RPC uh, is not affected by the flow effect of uh, RNFL because if you see this case, uh, this patient from 2014 or 2018, there is a progression of uh, glaucoma and it's possible to see the sign of the progression only with visual field, vessel densities, because there is a, a flow effect and the reduction of the RNFL is not more measurable. And then there is a relationship between the choroidal microvasculator dropout with visual field defect. It's possible now to translate the posterior imaging to the anterior image, imaging and to study the surgery and the effect of the surgery on the vascularity of the bleb. This is, this is a case of the functional bleb after microinvasive glaucoma surgery, and you can see that there is a displacement of the, of the vessel. That's the typical sign of the functional bleb. Controversy in uh, faded bleb, you can see that there is no displacement of the, the vessel. And so, the vessel density of the bleb could be considered as a biomarker of the functionality of the bleb uh, same after the, the surgery. When you study the, instead the normal tension glaucoma and uh, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, you can see that there is a decrease of the uh, vessel density, but is more in uh, normal tension glaucoma, as you stated in this paper, probably because uh, uh, the disease is uh, more chronic than uh, the later. And moreover, we observe a correlation between uh, RPC vessel density impairment and uh, the decrease of uh, RNFL thickness. But uh, we pay attention in case of uh, myopic eyes because, because uh, often it's possible to observe uh, this phenomena called uh, as a cleavage of the RNFL that appear as a dark areas that lack RPC. The other application of OCT angiography is in the neurodegenerative field. And uh, this because the, the retina is uh, like a window that opens into the brain. And so retinal ganglion cells share structural morphology with other neurons of the central nervous system. And so it's possible to apply this technology to Alzheimer's disease and to multiple sclerosis. So, in conclusion, OCT and geography is a safe, fast, and non-invasive technique for studying optic nerve heart circulation. The RPC attenuation is associated with the RNAFIL and the GCC thinning and visual field defect, and there is a special correlation. RPC is not affected by floor effect, like in advanced glaucoma, so is a useful tool for monitoring this patient in the later stage of glaucoma. And moreover, we can observe that the choroidal microvascular dropout that is related to the visual field. So, uh, OCTA uh, could be considered as a complementary tool for studying optic nerve heart disorder. And the fourth uh, longitudinal studies are needed to elucidate the temporal relationship between the vascular change and the optic nerve damage. So, uh, we could treat uh, something beside the uh, I appear. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Di Antonio. So uh, now we have time for discussion. So uh, if you have questions to our colleagues, uh, don't hesitate to take a microphone. Uh, Ask and ask questions. Yes, please take, uh, take the microphone. It's a qu no, it's working. It's a, it's a question for Professor D'Antonio. What do you think about early detection of Alzheimer's disease with NGOCT? May you repeat the question? What do you think about early detection of Alzheimer's disease with NGOCT? Okay, thank you. 
In Alzheimer's disease, uh, there is a, a recent publication of a JAM ophthalmology that uh, said that the, the better tool for uh, monitoring the, the disease is the RNFL thickness. But uh, now it's possible to uh, extend this uh, um, tool to OCT angiography applied on the macular area because the vessel density uh, impairment of the super superficial capillary plexus is an ill sign of the Alzheimer's disease. Questions to uh, Dr. Savasano. Uh, as you can see that the OCT on ge angiography is taking over now. Uh, is it time to say that fluorescein uh, angiography is becoming obsolete or is there indication still for fluorescein angiography? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, in uh, clinical, real clinical practice that we perform, uh, the OCT angiography that uh, is uh, about uh, four years and a half, we reduce totally the fluorescein angiography uh, study and evaluation for about 90%. And we reserved the uh, fluorescein angiography analysis just for the use and study of periphery. When we have some doubt, for example, of periphery, like uh, in uh, diabetic retinopathy, when we want to evaluate the, the, the extremely periphery. At the beginning, when we um, uh, uh, started with this technology, we performing both to understand what are seeing during the OCT angiography uh, starting. But actually, we reduced them more than 90%. Dr. Goss, can we use TCP in normal eyes that haven't been treated with laser or somehow? And the second question, Dr. Savastano, can we see leakage in OCTA sometime? Um, regarding your first question, I'm sure you can. We didn't do this and we didn't study it, but since it measures the, the front side and the back side of the cornea and it uses these uh, measurements, probably the relation between the front and back side will be normally normalized. So if you can use it in abnormalized, you can use it in normalized too, I'm sure. But we didn't do this until now. About the second question, by the HCT angiography, we can see the leakage effect. We have to thought about the HCT angiography in totally different uh, towards the uh, fluorescein angiography because the OCT angiography, all the device, study the uh, flow analysis into the vessel. And when you, we use the fluorescein angiography, we study the indirect effect of the science in indirect. So by the OCT angiography, we can't see the leakage effect. We can see the silhouette of vessels, but not the leakage. Yes. Uh, when you are looking at the vessel density of the macula, do you pay attention to the uh, density of the fovea? Do you take it in mind? Because uh, in many cases, I find that it is the decreased, and I don't find any. I cannot find any reason for that. Uh, correct. The vascularization of the fovea is uh, an important point because uh, we uh, don't have normative data about the enlargement of fovea vascular zone. Uh, normative data about uh, these sites should be improved in the future. Anyway, in the central part, so in foveola vascular zone, there are no circulation observable by the OCT angiography because anatomically there is a foveola vascular zone. Yes, please take the microphone. Yes, Dr. Bordery. Uh, do you know if there is any plans to have the OCT, angio-OCT for cornea analysis, for instance, for neovascular, neovascularization, 
in herpes or uh, terigen or any kind of uh, classification for neo neovascularization? You know, any plans to have this? Yes, it's quite interesting. Um, we've we have started to, to use angiography, angio CT uh, for assessing corneal neovascularization. Uh, well, the need is a little bit different when we compare with retina because uh, with the slit lump we clearly see the vessels. So we see, we see them better with, with OCT angiography, that's right, and, uh, and that's interesting, uh, but uh, it needs to be developed to uh, to see whether it uh, brings more information than uh, only <laughs> assessing a vessel that slit lump. That's, that's, that's quite interesting. Most of the times, OCT and geographic, uh, optic nerve and geographic defects are uh, following uh, retinal nerve fiber layer defects. <laughs> are there times that uh, OCT and geography defects precede retinal nerve fiber layer defects? Yes, uh, probably it's possible to add uh, RNFL defect uh, with the uh, damage of the super superficial uh, vascular plexus or around the optic nerve. Probably do uh, not only of, of glaucoma, but uh, even if in uh, vascular disease. For example, for in the parcel artery occlusion, it's uh, very easy to see that uh, in the thoracic angiography is not possible. And so you can make a sure the right diagnosis in patients that present a little scotoma, for example. Yes, please. Yes. Um, as well as for the glaucoma follow-up patients and the diabetic patients, do you use more the density map, the colors, for comparing, or do you use the numbers on the side? I use the map colors because uh, AngioView gives the possibility to obtain a, a trend analysis with a minimum of uh, five, uh, five scans for, for period in order to reduce the variability of the, the measurements. Any other questions? No. So if there is no, no more questions, I would like to thank my colleagues and uh, all of you for attending uh, uh, this uh, symposium. And I wish you a very nice and uh, pleasant meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you.